day service. I wonder if you just want to invite the presence of the Lord. The scripture talks about yielding our members to him. I want my body to be just a temple of the Holy Ghost. I want his spirit to flow through me today. God, I yield myself to you today. We yield ourselves, God, instruments of worship, praise to your name. We invite your holy presence in this place, God. Rule and reign in this sanctuary, God, for this next little while. I pray that your spirit would be God, sovereign in this place, that every mind would be submitted, subject to you, God. Whatever you desire to do, let our spirit tap into your spirit and flow with you today, God. Let your Holy Spirit descend in this place. Meet every need. Touch every heart today. God, we'll give you glory. We'll honor and magnify you because you're worthy. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Hallowed be your name, Lord. You're worthy of glory. You're worthy of glory today. Hallelujah to the name of Jesus. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. From everlasting to everlasting God, you reign and your name is above every name. Hallelujah. Holy are you, Lord. Worthy of praise. We adore and magnify you today. Be exalted. Be exalted in this place. We give you praise and honor you. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. The psalmist said, let us exalt his name together. I wonder if that's the reason you've come today to magnify the name of Jesus. I know we've got maybe Easter plans later today, but right now the... The God of Easter ought to be the center of our attention. He ought to receive every, every part of our being. Father, we focus upon you and give you our everything. We worship you and magnify you. Worship the Lord as we sing. And what are you turning to I? You open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. There's none like you, and into the darkness you shine, and out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you, there's none like you, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than it. Awesome and power, our God. Sing that again. Oh, our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome and power, our God. Our God. And into the darkness you shine. And out of the ashes we rise. No one like you, there's none like you. See our God, and our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, see our God is greater, our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, our God is awesome in power. Our God, our God is greater. Stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Oh, and if our God is with us, then who can ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what you say? And if our God is for us, then who can ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what you say?
today can you give glory to God come on with the hand clap of praise with your voice lifted high to God be all the glory all the honor all the praise blessed be the name of Jesus we worship you hallelujah hallelujah you are worthy in this place yes hallelujah thank you Lord for victory oh sing to God God be the glory to God. We give you glory and honor today. To God be all the glory that's due your name for the things that you have done. Thank you, Lord, for the blood that was shed. Thank you, Lord, for your resurrection power. Oh, yes, that I can stand here victorious. To God be all the glory. Oh, for the things he has done. Sing it with us. To
him a hand clap of praise. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the blood. Hallelujah. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for salvation, Lord. Thank you for healing. Thank you for life everlasting. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I wonder if you'd go to the Lord with me in prayer today. Special request for Tara Chappie. She wanted to be in church again today. She's struggling with some heart problems and possibility of them putting in a pacemaker. And Tara's just a young lady. I wonder if you just go to the Lord on her behalf today and just ask God to have his way in her life. Not just in this situation, but in her life. So many times it's crisis that brings people to Christ. And that's really the work that God wants to do is in the, the soul, in the spirit. I wonder if you just pray and ask God to have his way in this place today. I don't want to just get up, get my dress on my Sunday best and come to church. But I want God to have his way in this place. I want the spirit of the Lord to descend in this place. I want God to be praised and to do what he desires in this place. Let's pray and invite him to do just that. Father, we thank you today for this beautiful day, God. The opportunity to come into your house, into your presence. The presence of the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the almighty, all-powerful. God, we pray that you would have your way in this place. That you would draw each and every one of us, God, into a place of yielding to you, that you may have your way in each and every individual. God, across this room, I pray you would touch lives. Let the faith of God rise in this place, Lord. Minister healing virtue. I pray your touch upon Sister Tara. Let her feel the power of Almighty God. Do a work in her heart. Do a work in her life, God, that you may receive glory and honor. We give you the praise with thanksgiving, and to your name we give glory and honor. In the name of Jesus, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. You can make your way back to your seats. I want to welcome you to the Pentecostals of Peoria this Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day. We celebrate not the death, but the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For without the resurrection, the death would be absolutely meaningless. But I'm so thankful for the resurrection power of Christ. And not only was it for him, but the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 8 verse 11 If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you Then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies Through his spirit who dwells in you That's the hope that we have today Paul said if we have hope in this life only we're of all men most miserable It doesn't matter how this life works out I know that we've got a hope of a greater life in him for eternity. And I'm so grateful for that today. I'm going to invite our ushers, if they will, come. Wait on us today for the tithe and offering. God has been so good. Father, we thank you today for your spirit. Thank you for the opportunity to gather in this place, to lift up your name, to give glory to you. I pray, God, that you would just visit us in a special way today. Lord, you know what we have need before we even ask. And I pray that you would supply every need in this place according to your riches and glory. I pray that you would receive the tithe and offering as we give it from hearts of gratitude and joy. We'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
than a man lay down his life for a friend. But you and I were far from friends of God when he laid down his life for us. I'm glad, as Brother Lashley said, he didn't just lay it down, but he took it back up. And we celebrate today new life in Jesus Christ because he did die, but he's resurrected. He resurrected from the grave. Hallelujah. Thank you, choir. Thank you, church. Make your way back to your seats. You don't sit down, though. Aren't you glad God loves you? Look at your neighbor and tell him God loves you. Now, for some people, that'll be a lot easier than this next effort I'm going to ask you to do. Why don't you look that same person in the eye? I want you to tell him, and God loves me. You know, it's a lot easier for me to tell you that God loves you because I don't know who you are or what you are or what you've been, what you've done. But for me to look you in the eye, knowing who I am, 
say, God loves me. Oh, I wish we could say that with conviction. Because if you truly believe that God loved you the way he does, nothing would stop you. Nothing would get in your way, including your setbacks and your failures and your frustrations. Oh, how he loves us. Thank you, choir, for those beautiful songs. Thank you, music staff. You did a wonderful job today. You're just amazing. Even though we interrupted your all your practices and even a snowstorm interrupted your practice. Anybody notice it's snowing on Easter? This is April. We got our snowstorm last week. We should be done, right? But it's good to be in the house of God. Here today celebrating our risen Savior. Our risen Savior. If you have your Bibles with me, we'll get right into the Word. You know, many of you have turkeys and ham. <laughs> Brother Grant, it was funny. I was looking up some things on Easter. A traditional Anglican affair for Easter is ham. But we find our roots in Jewish faith. <laughs> I want to talk to you today on this subject, a worthy Passover. A worthy Passover. I don't know if you realize it or not, but Easter is actually celebrated on the Passover holiday. If you have your Bibles, you'd like to go to Exodus chapter 12. We're going to start reading in verse 7. The first Passover. I find it amazing that the first Passover was the doorway to Israel's new life. It was the door that opened up and they walked out of Egypt and into a brand new life. But it took a Passover. It took a sacrifice. They'd been slaves for 400 years. God was endeavoring to deliver them from Egypt. All the signs and wonders that he did in Egypt. All the uh, judgments that he brought against them. You could read. It's a very interesting story. And not just an interesting story, but an incredible life lesson. And we're going to pick up where God's instructed Moses to tell the people of Israel to take a lamb of the first year from the flock. Actually, a lamb or a kid. A goat. I saw some of your eyes light up. A lamb or a kid, a goat of the first year. Of no blemish. And it was amazing. There was a, how many of you ever bought a, a car and they got that so many point checklist? Well, there's a 50 point checklist that a lamb had to pass in order to be eligible to be offered up. Five blemishes alone could be in the ear, several in the eye. They had to find that perfect lamb of the first year. Then he said in verse 7, they'll take some of the blood after they've slain it and they'll put it on the two posts on the and on the lintel of the house where they eat. Then they shall eat of the flesh on the night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread, with bitter herbs they shall eat it. This was the first Passover. Now let me take you to the final Passover. Luke 22 and 15, Jesus said, with fervent desire, I have desire to eat. Everyone say this. It was a particular Passover. He had ate, he'd been partaker of 33 up until this time. 32. This would be his 33rd Passover that he has eaten in his lifetime. But he said, it's with desire, fervent desire, that I've desired to eat this Passover with you 
before I suffer. When the apostle Peter, talking to the Jews on the day of Pentecost, was talking about Jesus Christ, he said, Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you took by lawless hands, crucified and put to death. Thank God he didn't leave us there. Verse 24, he says, Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death. I love this next this phrase. It <laughs> was not possible. There's just some things that can't keep the church down. In fact, nothing can keep the church down. But death, it wasn't possible that it could hold him. Thank you, Jesus, for this day. Thank you, God, for what it represents. Thank you, God, for the sacrifice that you gave your life for us. And thank you, oh God, that you didn't just stay in a tomb. But, Lord, you resurrected power and dominion and took hold, oh God, of victory for your church. Victory over the grave and victory over sin. Victory for eternity. Thank you, oh God. And I pray today, Lord, that you would anoint my lips. Anoint these words. But, God, most importantly, anoint my spirit to, to speak the things of God and to let your word find its way in our heart that we might leave this place today changed, transformed by the power of your resurrection. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. 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 Greet somebody next to you for a few minutes. Tell them they look beautiful today. Praise God. I want to say how good it is to see you in the house of the Lord this Easter. It's good to have Brother Sir Charles Robinson back from Indiana. We love this young man and appreciate him and his walk with God and his fervor and desire to do the things of God. And just to give you a heads up, he's going to be heading back to Latvia this uh, summer uh, on another mission trip. You can go ahead and get that. I won't say anything about it. <laughs> it's good to be in the house of God among family, right? Yeah. Amen. If you can't pick on family, who can you pick on? Amen. And uh, since he's going back to Latvia, the, uh, he's going to be... Um, going as a missionary, uh, and uh, we're looking forward to that. So if you would like to, again, um, invest into this young man's future, not just in this young man's future, but in the kingdom of God. And uh, uh, he will be coming back to you sometime in May and asking if you'd like to help send this young man uh, back overseas. Last time was a wonderful time. We uh, read all the wonderful reports, and we're looking for greater things. Amen. And all of our friends, if I start naming names, I'm going to get in trouble. But let me just say, Scott, it's so good to see you here in the house of the Lord. I've been saving that seat for you for a long time, man. You look beautiful today. Good to see you, man. A worthy Passover. A worthy Passover. Since Genesis chapter 3, man has lived under the curse of sin. Now, today, if I can't get to you the... uh, uh, all, all the ins and the outs and the uh, the proper pronunciations of some of these words and maybe the uh, whom, hermeneutics of a, of a message. I pray today that I can get you the spirit of the Passover. I don't want to preach you necessarily a good message today as much as I want to impart to you the message of the Passover. You see, since Genesis chapter 3, we've lived under a curse of sin. 
Adam and Eve were planted into the garden of God and fellowshiped with God each and every day, and then sin entered the picture. And ever since that day, you and I have, developed, have had this problem, this separation with God. God told Adam that in the day that he would eat of the tree or that he would sin, he would die, and die he did. Spiritually, sin created a separation between God and man that's described as a spiritual death. Paul tells us later on in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 that the wages of sin is death. It's a spiritual death. Thank God he went on to explain that through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we have eternal life. But the conundrum of society and humanity since the garden has been the effort to escape the wages of sin and somehow secure the hope of eternal life. Ever since Genesis chapter 3, it's been this, this desire, this hope for reconciliation. So jumping ahead in my sermon today, it was not until the cross and the resurrection that this was made possible. I want you to understand how important the cross and the resurrection are today. You see, substitutes of innocent animals were instituted as temporary pardons for a year for the sins of mankind. They couldn't completely remove it. They would just move it ahead a year. And human efforts to comply with the law of God that he gave man were um, supported by this blood sacrifice. It was all to reconcile. The whole purpose of that was not to give God glory. It was not because God demanded it or he would kill humanity. It was man's efforts to somehow make pardon or make restitution for the sin between, that kept us from holy God. These were efforts that we used in order to attain fellowship once again with God. You see, God didn't do anything wrong. It was humanity that did. And so, therefore, humanity had to make these efforts in order to commune or be back in relationship with Jesus, with, with Jehovah God. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11, the apostle Paul said, Christ came as the high priest of good things to come. With the greater and the more perfect tabernacle not made of hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered into the most holy place once. It doesn't say once and for all. Once for you and I. Once for all of us and obtained eternal redemption. After 400 years of slavery in Egypt, God would save Israel from their idol worshiping and heathen masters. Since we're discussing some Old Testament types that are revealed in New Testament fulfillment, are we having trouble with these things again? One of these days, soon, <laughs> we're going to get this thing figured out. We're hoping to have it by next week, right? Praise Jehovah. Can you can y'all hear me? There we go. By the time you guys get that done, they kick back in. After 400 years of slavery to Egypt, God would save Israel from their idol worshiping and heathen masters. And we're discussing today through the Passover, Old Testament types and shadows that are revealed later on in the New Testament fulfillment. Let us understand that Egypt for Israel is symbolic of a worldly lifestyle from which God delivers modern humanity. True to his character back then, once again, just as he did with Adam and Eve, God utilizes blood. The blood of innocent animals to stand in the stead of the guilty. Israel had been influenced by Egypt morally and spiritually. So even they were guilty of sin against God. But by the hope of their Abrahamic covenant, God was about to make a way. If Exodus chapter 12 and verse 7 Moses said, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat. The doorpost on each side and the lintel being above. Isn't it amazing? A beautiful symbol of the cross. And then they shall eat the flesh on the night, roasted with fire, unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat. 
In verse 13, it says, now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy when I strike the land of Egypt. It was the Passover, the blood of the Passover that gave them a Passover. As the angel of, of judgment would come through the land of Egypt, they dwelled in the land of Egypt. They dwelled among a heathen people. They were guilty of sin. They were guilty of wrongs against God. And God said, the only way out of this is for a sacrifice, a Passover, if you please. If you'll apply it to your life, if you'll apply it to your home, I will pass over you when I come to do judgment. You see, sin is no light matter. Sin is no light matter. In Adam and Eve's case, it took one sin to separate them from God. Sin is simply rebellion against God. It's my will against God's will. And no matter how you slice it, it is uh, it's no light matter. And it doesn't matter how society tries to assuage its true violence that's done to our soul. And as a result of sin's eternal consequence, redemption is a bloody work. Redemption is a bloody work. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22 tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. All through the descriptions given concerning the Old Testament priesthood. Anybody ever read those through the book of Leviticus? Isn't that fun? Great fun, entertaining reading. Have you ever noticed that the priesthood, the men, here we are again, these are simply men standing in God's stead trying to do away with the sin that mankind brought into the world. Here we are, these priests. We see blood applied all over the tabernacle to each of the furnishings. And blood is applied to it. To the priests themselves, when they go through the process of the ear and, and, the, and the thumb and the toe, it's this blood that's applied. All of this is a stark reminder that you and I need a Savior. Every bit of it was a reminder that it's blood that is the only, only hope for mankind is the blood of a Passover. In ourselves, you and I have no righteousness and justice for our sin demands death. The blood of an innocent animal sacrifice brought Israel once again face to face with the consequences of their sin. Every animal they brought to the priest, every animal they brought to the altar of sacrifice, when that blood was shed, they realized that this is a result of my sin. This is a result of my wrong. This animal is taking my place, so to speak. This is the Passover where God will pass over what I've done. God will pass over the sin that I have brought into my life for yet one more year but in those sacrifices Hebrews chapter 10 verses 3 and 4 even this act of obedience there was no permanent satisfaction but in those sacrifices Paul says there is a reminder of sins every year There's a reminder of sin every year. For it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. It was the implementation of the blood of this literal Passover lamb that called that, caused that angel of judgment to pass over the dwelling and the occupants inside and not exact vengeance upon those that would be occupying that particular dwelling. In Matthew chapter 1 and 21, the angel finally would appear to Mary. How wonderful. They didn't realize the scope of this promise when he said, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Oh God, finally a Passover. Finally a worthy Passover. Finally hope that's going to do away with sin and not just push it ahead another year. It would have been nice if he could have done it in a clinical manner, a nice sterile environment. How is this to happen? What if God could use his infinite wisdom to find a loophole in judgment and appease justice without this 
bloody sacrifice. Well, isn't he the king of kings? Couldn't he grant a pardon? I mean, presidents do it. Certainly the king of kings could do it. No, his righteousness wouldn't allow it. He knew, he knew before he said, let there be light that he was the lamb that was slain. Revelations 13 and 8 said, before the foundation of the world, he knew that one of these days, before he said, let there be light, before he put the first plant in the earth, before the first fish brought forth in the sea, before the first man, Adam, was created, he realized that down the road, man is going to fail. There's going to be a say, this, this chasm called sin. And I am going to have to make myself a body and come to earth and be that sacrifice, that worthy Passover. Aren't you glad that in spite of all that, he still stood on the portals of heaven and said, let there be? (laughs) Knowing the agony. Knowing the pain, knowing the suffering, knowing the rejection, knowing everything that would happen. Still, that day in eternity, it didn't stop him because he loved you. Oh, how he loves you and me. And he would stand out there on the portals of nothing and say, let there be. Ah, what a worthy Passover. John Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him. And John 1, 29, it said, Behold! He didn't say God. The Lamb of God. The Passover of God. Who takes away... Doesn't just roll it ahead. Aren't you glad God doesn't hold your your guilt and your shame over you as as a... a weight of judgment against you? Aren't you glad he doesn't use it to coerce you? Oh no, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we simply confess. That means he has separated our wrongs as far as the east from the west, the scripture says. No longer are they held over us. I believe, Bishop, that the psalmist was looking for that day when he said, so far has they removed our transgressions from us as far as the east as from the west because still he lived in a period of law. Every year he had to face his sins Once again, I believe that he looked ahead to that day. Hallelujah. The scripture said, Abraham longed for that day. I believe that David longed for that day. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away my sin. The perfect Lamb of God that would offer his blood as a covering for any and all who would abide in him. You remember the dwelling? For only inside that place of blood covering was her safety and security. And today, I am grateful. I'm, I'm so excited to be able to offer you and I the hope that as long as we'll stay covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, as long as we will confess our sins, as long as we will come in under that sacrifice, we have hope. Amen. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 from the uh, message Bible. Well, Bishop calls it a good book about the Bible. How many of you know what Genesis, or Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says? The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. Well, let, let me read it to you from the message. And this is why Bishop says it's a good book about the Bible. Since we've compiled this long and sorry record of sinners, both us and them, and prove that we are utterly incapable of living this glorious lives Christ wills for us. God did it for us. Out of sheer generosity, he put us right in right standing with himself, a pure gift. He got us out of the mess we're in, and he restored us to where he always wanted us to be. And he did it by the means of Christ Jesus. God sacrificed himself, Jesus, on the altar of the world to clear the world of sin. 
Having faith in him sets us in the clear. God decided on this course of action in full view of the public to set the world in the clear with himself here through the sacrifice of Jesus. Finally, everyone say finally. We don't realize the power of the cross and the power of his resurrection. For 4,000 years, men and women lived under the curse of sin, under the, this, this cloud of sin that hung over them. For 4,000 years, only for 2,000 years, brothers and sisters, only for half that time have we known this dispensation called grace. You think about that. Jesus finally taking care of the sins that he so patiently endured. Calvary was about restitution and reconciliation. And that had to be made since God is righteous and cannot in any wise be fraudulent. Had to do it. Sin demanded payment of death. So Christ fulfilled that payment. Colossians 1 and 20, Paul said, he did it to reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you and I, who once were alienated and enemies in our mind by wicked works. How many of you have been guilty of wicked works? He said, yet he now has reconciled. In the body of his flesh, through his death, to present you holy. This was not for him. He didn't have to do it, Brother Ray, to show himself powerful or almighty. He already was. This wasn't a war between God and Satan. This was a payment for you and I. This was all about you and I. He said, you and I who were once alienated and enemies of our mind, he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present us holy. For finally we can be holy. Finally we can be without sin. Finally there was a a pure, just, worthy Passover that made you and I pure and holy before God. Blameless. When was the last time you looked in the mirror and felt blameless? Without reproach in his sight. And where Calvary was about restitution and reconciliation, the resurrection was about restoration. Aren't you glad God didn't just pay you debt and just leave you out there? But no, he made it about restoration. Through his resurrection power, we have the opportunity to be restored to our original relationship. Jesus spoke about it in Luke chapter 19 in verse 10. He said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that, not who, that which was lost. What was lost? That relationship between God and man that was lost because of sin. And God said, I am the Passover. I'm finally going to get here and bring us all the way back to the Garden of Eden to where there's no longer separation between God and man. His whole purpose for coming to earth was to reconcile and restore that relationship that had been lost in the garden where God and man walked every day, fellowship every day, nothing between them, no hurt, no pain, no sorrow, no sin, no suffering, nothing. It was just between God and man, this fluid relationship every single day, continually for millennia, God had waited in anticipation of the Passover Uh, This single Passover, Passovers would come and go. Uh, Ever since Moses, uh, every year there was a Passover. And from heaven he watched uh, with bated breath. Uh, One of these days, uh, one of these days, uh, there's going to be a Passover. And I'm going to sit there uh, and I'm going to eat the last one with my disciples. Then I will be that Passover lamb. So we read in our text fervent desire finally I can see you without seeing sin finally I can look at you pure and clean and holy without seeing the sin of your life finally I can see you as I desired as I decreed as I hoped for you to be with fervent desire 
I've desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. It was not that he desired death, especially the death of the cross. We read in the garden where he prays, Father, if it be possible, if there's any other way for this to happen, if there's any other way around this bloodletting, if there's any other way than me being this Passover lamb, Nevertheless, if there's no other way, this is not what I want. It had to be that, Brother Grant, because he said, not my will. There is a base desire in every human body to live. Not my will, but thine be done. He didn't want death, but he desired that Passover in anticipation of the atonement his blood would finally bring. Looking back, I'm sure, Brother Lashley, he looked back all the way to the first Passover and the first lamb that was slain. And he realized that just in a few hours, the revelation of that original Passover was just about to be fulfilled. The next verse, 16, he says, for I say to you, I will no longer eat of it. You can almost hear the excitement as well as the frustration of all the others that he had to eat in his voice. I will no longer, finally, I'm going to be able to eat this Passover. He says, I will no longer eat of it till it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. This was his, this was a passion of Christ. This is why he was so excited to eat this Passover. For 33 years he had shared Passover. But this would be the last symbolic meal of atonement. (laughs) He couldn't wait to eat this Passover. He couldn't wait for this to be accomplished because this is the last one. This one, by the way, when the end of this Passover is accomplished, Passover will have truly come. This was the one he had yearned to experience for 4,000 years. 4,000 years of accumulated sin. 4,000 years and countless animal sacrifices. 4,000 years of inadequate sacrifice. No wonder he would say, with fervent desire. He didn't just say with desire, I have des-. He didn't just say, I've desired to eat this. He said, but with fervent desire. I have desired to eat this Passover. Finally a worthy Passover. Finally one that would get the job done. Because this Passover marks the beginning of a new dispensation that's called grace. And when nothing will work before, Paul would say, God spoke to him and said, my grace is sufficient. Oh, how many of you are glad for the grace of God that came from the Passover? Hallelujah. My grace is sufficient to do what couldn't be done before. And Romans chapter 5 and 20 says, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Hallelujah. I am so grateful for the grace that was brought by this Passover. 4,000 years of accumulated grace was taken care of by one spotless lamb, by one Passover lamb, the Lamb of God. And it didn't stop there. That blood that was shed 2,000 years ago still cleanses, still heals, still forgives. That Passover is still active today. Christ died as our Passover lamb that we might have hope in him for eternity. Not only were we lost in sin. I don't know if there's many Jewish people in the house today. Most of us were heathen Gentiles. We were out of covenant. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12 tells us that the cross took care of that too, Brother Lashley. 
Remember that in times past, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to covenants of the promise, without hope, without God in the world. Do you realize what this Passover lamb did? If you're Jewish in the house, would you raise your hand? That means every last one of us were out of covenant and had no hope. Besides our sin, we had no covenant with God. But now, verse 13, in Christ Jesus. Now remember, Paul's talking to the, ch to the church in Ephesus, a bunch of heathens like you and I. He said, now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Oh, hallelujah. You see, we as Americans, we think we, we think we are the greatest people on the planet. We don't care what the Chinese do. We don't care what the North Koreans do. Really don't care what the Russians do because we're Americans. But if we would have had a biblical understanding of the days in which this was written. We would understand that if we were not Jewish, we didn't have hope. We were without hope. You see, it's hard for us with our Americanized minds to grasp the, the importance of what happened this day. He said, he himself is our peace. He made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them. The Jews needed to be reconciled to God. The Gentiles needed to be reconciled to God. And he said he's going to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, which he put to death their hostility. Could you just get, clap your hands together and thank God for the Passover, the blood, hallelujah, the sacrifice, the unity that his, purchase, that his blood purchased for us. closing today let me give a practical application to our lives and how this marvelous miracle gospel of Jesus Christ is applied to our lives if you're here today and you've never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and you don't understand what all the Hubbaloo is about, about Easter. I read in, her, in this sermon that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of that sin is death. But thank God he didn't leave us there. He went on to say that the gift of God is eternal life. But it's through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, what does that through mean? Well, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the gospel. If someone were to tell you the gospel, the good news, that's what that word gospel means, simply meant that though we were dead in trespasses and sin and without hope, headed to hell, God loved us and gave himself for us and died in our stead. And then he was buried in a tomb. For three days he remained and then he resurrected, victorious over death, hell, and the grave. That's incredible. But his resurrection is no more Amazing than Lazarus. You see, Lazarus was dead for four days. Well, 
well, God was dead. Folks, you can't kill God. You might kill a body that he lived in, but you can't kill God. I was trying to explain this to my daughters the other day. God was in Christ. So where was God whenever he was in Christ? And God died on the cross. God didn't die on the cross. Jesus Christ. That house. If I were to take this to the Pacific Ocean, or the Illinois River for that matter, And I would put this d- down into the river, and I'd bring it up. What's in this bottle? The river. Is all the river in this bottle? But everything in this bottle is the river. So it was with Jesus Christ. God was in Christ. Apostle said, reconciled the world to himself. So God died, Jesus died, the body died, but God wasn't dead. God was just as alive as he ever was. He just moved out of that house for a minute. And he was on business for you and I. The Bible says he took captivity captive, or in other words, he went and took those souls that that lamb had just pushed their sin ahead one year, one more year. And when that Passover lamb died, he said, enough is enough. Come with me. It's all been forsaken. It's all been forgiven. It's all washed away. And so God died in the form of Jesus Christ. How do you like how I got around that one? And then resurrect for the reason that you and I might have new life. So if I were to ask you to obey the gospel, I don't necessarily want to go and be crucified. How about you? I'm claustrophobic, so don't put me in the ground until I do pass. And it's outside my abilities to have supernatural life in Jesus Christ. However, I can die to my sins. Just as Jesus Christ died on the cross and he he died to his will to live, you and I can die to our will to live to ourself and to our sinful ways. Paul said that we're buried with him in baptism. Like I said, don't put me down in the ground. God doesn't necessarily want you to die for him. He wants you to live for him. So, you know, a lot of times as Pentecostals, we we say these terms like everybody knows what we're talking about. You got to die. I don't want to die. You must be crucified with Christ. I saw they still practice that in the Philippines. That hurts. No, we die to our ways of sin, and then we are buried with him, Paul said, in waters of baptism. And many people stop here. But why would you just want to stop without the power of the resurrection? I don't want to just die to my sin. Because my sinful nature seems to have resurrection power of its own. Paul said, therefore we're buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. So there's got to be a difference whenever I come up out of the waters of of baptism. There's got to be something that transformed my life. Peter outlined this process whenever he was preaching the gospel to the Jews on the day of Pentecost. He said, repent. Repent. 
be baptized and after that you would receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and he said it's not just for you guys in Acts chapter 2 and verse 39 he said for the promises to you and to your children and all who are afar off even as many as our God shall call so if you and I are going to obey this beautiful gospel of this Passover today it's in repentance and repentance is far more than just an apology. Yeah. It's a death to this way of life that I've been living that's been wrong. Right. How many of you ever heard somebody say, I'm not that person anymore? Yeah. We all say that about our past, right? Oh, that's not me. <laughs> Without the power of the Holy Ghost it is. Scripture says that the leopard can't do away with his spots, neither can the Ethiopian change the color of his skin. Man can't change his character. You push him hard enough and far enough, and that old nature will pop up. Oh, but the Scripture says old things pass away, and all things become new. You become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. The power of the cross, the power of the resurrection. Just stand with me today. As we remember the power of this Passover. So many today live in the shadow of past failures and wrongs and sins. You know, pastors, we're we're harder on ourselves than anybody else would ever be. Especially when it comes to us and coming before God. For 4,000 years, man had to live under the shadow of his past sin. He didn't have a choice. For 4,000 years, the apostle said, a remembrance every year. And the enemy would like for you to maintain that tradition. How many of you have ever done stuff in your life that you're ashamed of, wish hadn't done? If you go back, you change it. The enemy knows that. And he tries to bring it back up again and again. And never so much as whenever we start thinking about God and start thinking about, man, I would like to live for God, but I would like to do right, but in all these shadows of 4,000 years, it would seem far back as I can remember, I've fallen and I've stumbled and I've not been able to do what was right before. For 4,000 years, it would seem my whole life. Can I tell you today that 2,000 years ago, there was a worthy Passover that shed his blood so you don't have to live under that cloud. 4,000 years of sin was done away with in a moment. And from that day forward until grace is no more. From this point on, the apostle said, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. He don't stop there. Every head bowed and every eye closed in this place. Because if God just forgives me of my sins, there's still the remembrance. God says, I want to do more than forgive you. I want to cleanse you. Wipe away the stain. Wipe away the shame. Wipe away everything that would hinder you from being who and what I called you to be. Can I tell you today that God has desired to eat this Passover today with you? If you're here today and God's not had the opportunity to forgive you of your yesterdays, can I tell you that God has with 
fervent desire, desire to see you in this house today to tell you that, hey, I can take care of that in a moment. You don't have to live under the cloud of yesterday. You don't have to live under the accumulated sins of yesteryear. There is a worthy Passover that gave His life's blood just to draw you close to Him. I know it's Easter. I know we got a lot of things going on, but I'd be remiss if I didn't open these altars and give opportunity for someone and maybe all of us to take advantage one more time of that worthy Passover blood that was shed. Anybody in the house would like to once again avail yourself of resurrection power? Once again, put everything under the blood and lift up holy hands and life. (laughs) Experience that life more abundant. Come on. Put yesterday under the blood. You have one. You don't have to carry that weight. God went to the cross and carried it for you. Come on. He's the worthy Passover. You don't have to carry that out of this building today. You don't have to carry that shame. You don't have to wake up tomorrow with it hanging over your head. You can come to an altar of prayer. You can open up your heart and your life. and You could confess your sins. And God would forgive you in a moment. And not just forgive you, but heal you. Fill you with His presence. You could be baptized in His name even on this day. And you could experience that glorious gift of the gospel. Hallelujah. 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 You have won it all. Come on, you don't have to have that weight. You don't have to carry that burden. You don't have to carry that shame anymore. Come on, all you got to do, you don't have to confess it to me. You don't have to confess it to anyone. If we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful. He is just. He is God. He is your Passover. You are the Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus thank you Jesus you want this for me you did this for me come on if you're in this altar and you have experienced that would you just lift your hands in gratitude in worship in thanksgiving God thank you for the sacrifice thank you Jesus oh yeah
glad that he chose me to live in this dispensation, in this time to know this truth. Pastor mentioned Abraham and David, and I couldn't help but think of Isaiah, the prophets who prophesied about this. And brothers and sisters, you and I are the ones who get to live it and experience it. God chose you. God chose me during this dispensation. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thanks be unto God for that unspeakable gift. Hallelujah. Thank you for resurrection, life, and power, Lord. The opportunity to live in newness of life by the power of the same Spirit that raised Jesus dwells in you and me. Oh, what a happy Easter. What a happy Easter. A worthy Passover. Oh, God bless you. God go with you. I do wish you a happy Easter. Hope that you have wonderful time today with family and friends. And remember the true reason for the season. Greet our guests, if you would, today. And God go with you in grace and peace. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.